It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Edward P. Morgan and Don Hollenbeck, both of the CBS television news staff. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Francis P. Bolton, Congressman from Ohio. Mrs. Bolton, Mr. Knight has just introduced you as Congressman Bolton instead of Congresswoman Bolton. Is that by any chance a concession to the male side of the House? No, you see, as a matter of fact, I'm a woman Congressman. That's what I really am, you see. Well, how do the gentlemen feel about being oh, a woman well, you congressman? See, when the speaker recognizes me, he says that he recognizes the gentlewoman from Ohio. And I always feel as though someone had just uh, crowned me. Are you always gentle? <laughs> <laughs> well, now, you've been in Congress for 13 years, yes. Mrs. Bolton. Yes. Uh, have any of your male colleagues hinted diplomatically, of course, that uh, Perhaps they thought that woman's place was even so in the home? Well, you know, when you get to be a grandmother, maybe you have a right to enlarge the... Well, extend the walls of your home into something a little larger. I think they feel that we, we have every right in the Congress. They're glad to have us. Well, you certainly have extended your walls. I mean, you've gone beyond the Congress to the United Nations and... Uh, yes, thanks to the President. Maybe uh, you would have some comment perhaps on woman's wider place in, in the world. Can, can, women, can women run things better than men, Mrs. Bolton, do you think, speaking of government as a whole? Well, I think we need a lot of training, but I think we could do pretty well in some places where you haven't done so well, don't you? Now, nothing personal, please. <laughs> <laughs> We're supposed to be asking the question. Oh, you two gentlemen, you're quite wonderful. But <laughs> speaking of the United Nations, yeah. Mrs. Bolton, and uh, President Eisenhower has appointed you a member of the American delegation. What is your impressions of the operation of the United Nations uh, in these first few days of the 8th Assembly? Well, it's been very interesting. Of course, it's very different from Congress. When we once vote, we can't explain our vote after it's done. We have to do all our explaining to begin with. They have a lot of odd things like that from the, from the parliamentary standpoint. But it's, it's a very wonderful place to be. One has so much of the world to realize so, so vividly all the time that uh, one's just one little piece of the world. Well, do you think most of us Americans realize that? I mean, oh, uh, no, but we've got to, Mr. Yes, Hollenbeck. That's we what must I was realize it. If we, if we do understand that. What strikes you, Mrs. Bolton, as you work in it and as you observe it, uh, as the most realistic part about the United Nations? Most realistic, what do you mean? Well, I mean by that, what are the instruments of it? What are the pieces of machinery in it, if I may say so, uh, that would be most likely to continue to work for what we all hope for, which I suppose is yes, peace? I suppose it is. Uh, I think, well, I'm on the trusteeship committee, committee number four. And we have to do with the, so many of the little countries that haven't gotten any place yet the people who haven't any education, who live out in the backwoods. And uh, it, it, it's, a very, it's, it's a very moving place to be. The efforts that are made by the, the uh, metropolitan areas, as they call the, the administrating countries, uh, their efforts to give opportunity to these countries. Do you think everybody's doing what they should in this Or do we endeavor? any of us do all we should? Well, I just Of course they aren't doing no. all they should. But it's very impressive how much the countries are trying to do. Mm -hmm. I'm very much impressed with it. But one wonders, Mrs. Bolton, really, uh, with all of the frustration that all of us are peaked up with after the war, if you can really cut through the ponderousness of red tape and even diplomacy and get things actually done, how do you feel about that after a long time in Congress and in the United Nations? Well, of course, a very frustrating thing because I think all Americans are very impatient we want immediate results. We forget that it took us quite a while to become a nation. Even Rhode Island didn't sign up, you know, until after we were all done. And uh, we're impatient with everything. It's going to be a very long while. 
Why do you mind. think Americans are impatient, Mrs. Bolton? Well, they want everything to happen overnight. Look at the look at NATO. Look at the the European thing. The the uh, that's a very exciting thing that happened in 1949 when they went to Strasbourg, and they tried 12 nations who were fighting for centuries, couldn't speak the same language, and yet they met at Strasbourg to try to form some kind of union, to try to understand each other. You think that's going to work? Eventually, yes. It has to. It must. And uh, the men I speak to, that I talk with, uh, about it, the foreigners, they're, they're very eager to have it happen. They, they, they know it's going to be a little slower than they wish it might be. The composition of the American delegation to this session of the United Nations is uh, varied, to say the least. What is your feeling of the atmosphere among those men and women that you're working with, Governor Burns and the others on the delegation? Well, it's a very mixed delegation, as you say. Um, uh, Mr. Carey is very constructive. He's very... Um, uh, Mr. Carey's with the CIO. Uh, he's, uh, well, he, he's from Chicago. Uh, he's a pastor of a church. He's a lawyer. Oh, yes. I've, I've and, made a mistaken uh, identity. Uh, he's very keen, very alert. And uh, young Henry Ford is amazing. He's a hard worker. Yes. What about Mr. Ford's speech today? That was I his maiden effort. I understand it was Did really, it? really something. And that he mm. delivered it very well. And that everybody felt his, his sincerity and his earnestness. That's the thing, I think, uh, that one feels most of all in this, in this new delegation. In, this, in these contacts that you make with people in the United Nations, Mrs. Bolton, how do you feel uh, about communicating with other people from other lands in the trusteeship thing, for instance, itself? Uh, do you f feel that basically we're talking the same language, or is there a great barrier of misunderstanding? And I think there's, there's a barrier of misunderstanding. But I think we're all so eager to reach the goal of understanding that there's great effort being made. I've, I've taken a great deal of pains to meet the members of the Trusteeship Council, or the, of the, of the committee. And uh, I find them very approachable and very human and very eager Where to, do you find the most me. eagerness, uh, Mrs. Bolton? Well, uh, I don't know. Of course, I've known the Near East very well, mm -hmm. and the African group, because that's my subcommittee on the Foreign Affairs Committee. And uh, they're very anxious to talk. They're very anxious to sit down with us, just as Prince Juan of, uh, uh, of Thailand. I sat next to him at dinner tonight, at the Netherlands dinner. And uh, they're all very eager to understand us and to have us get their point of view. They feel we don't have it. Mrs. Bolton, you mentioned the House Foreign Affairs Committee, of which you're a veteran member. Do you feel that the other members of the committee uh, share your basic enthusiasm uh, for the United Nations? Well, we have a few arguments about it because we, we you know, we're kind of economy-minded. But uh, I don't know whether you noticed that Mr. Richards made quite a point of that in his speech in the, Con in the United Nations a day or two ago. And everybody seemed to agree that a lot of money could be saved in many ways. But I think our, our Foreign Affairs Committee is quite convinced that there must be a, a, a United Nations. If we don't have that, what have we? Then there's no place for us to meet. That's the second question she's asked us, Don, which we can't answer. Yes. <laughs> oh, I'm I, sorry. I don't want to take the... Uh, <laughs> you I know, don't take we women are apt to get outside the rules, you know. <laughs> I don't want to take the discussion off the general, shall we say, human level, mm -hmm. but your son Oliver and you, I believe, are the only mother and son team in Congress. Do yes, you ever have any yes. divergent views on world politics? Uh, I don't think so. No, not on world politics. Does he he's, have he's voted membership? right along. He has a, he's on the, the post office committee. Oh, yes. Well, where do you feel that women can be most valuable in government? Either, inter and I'm speaking of either internationally or in a, an individual domestic government. Where can they best make themselves felt? Well, I've always thought that we women have a very special work to do uh, with other women with everything that has to do with children, which of course is health, education, housing, everything of that kind, and then general understanding. I think we have a, 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 a well, we get a lot of hunches, you know, about how things should be. And I think we have a, a, a desire that is a little different from yours. Why shouldn't it be? 
I, I do believe so strongly that wh when we, the two of us, work together, that's when we're going to build a world. Tell me, just uh, a, a, a matter of curiosity, how many women do have executive and administrative and, and uh, council jobs in the United Nations? Do, could uh, you? Well, there are 20, there are 20 uh, alternates and delegates. Mm -hmm. Delegates and alternates, I mm -hmm. should say. Then there are a good many on the staffs. Mm -hmm. In other words, they do very play... Very intelligent a, places uh, and very responsible jobs. Oh, yes. Mrs. Bolden, as a final question, we had Madam Pendit, the present president of the assembly, on Chronoscope the other night and asked her what her constituents thought about her being at the United Nations, and she said, to our astonishment, that they wish she would come home and tend to them. What is uh, the reaction of your constituents in Cleveland, and what do you tell them? Well, it's been very interesting to me. Uh, that they have been very enthusiastic about my appointment to the United Nations. I've had some perfectly marvelous expressions of pleasure that I was to be here. Uh, a sort of a steadying uh, force, apparently, in their minds. Very, very eager to, to do everything that uh, I should do to further their interests. They're not feeling that, that uh, I'm away from them. They feel I'm very close to them and that everything that matters in the United States has to do with foreign policy. Therefore, Th if I'm in here, it's a good place for me to be. Thank you, Mrs. Bolton, very much. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Edward P. Morgan and Don Hollenbeck, both of the CBS television news staff. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Francis P. Bolton, Congressman from Ohio. <coughs> It's World Series time, the best days of the year for baseball fans. And this year again, the World Series is Longines time. Yes, all umpires of both American and National Leagues use Longines watches exclusively for timing all games, including the World Series. Truly, the most honored watch in the world of sport is Longines, the only watch in history to win 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medals, and so many honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. And that is why, throughout the world, no other name on a watch carries the prestige of Longines, the watch of first choice in sport, the watch of first choice with discriminating men and women the world over. And yet, do you know that you may buy and own or proudly give a Longines watch for as little as seventy-one fifty? Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem. Agency for Longines Whitnor watches. History repeated, and you are there Sundays on the CBS television network.